Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. The Lord hears us when we call. The Lord fills our hearts with gladness. The Lord grants peace to our weary souls. Because you live, O Christ. don't get to sing those Easter hymns much during the year, so I love getting them in, but also the theme, because you live, O oh Christ, we can live, we can live abundantly, we can approach the throne of God, not just on Sunday morning, but any moment of any day, and know that we will be embraced and welcomed home. 
because he lives. With that assurance, let us be bold together then and approach the throne of grace with the truth of our lives. And I invite you now to join, to join me in our unison prayer of confession and preparation for worship today. Risen Christ, we are often troubled by our doubts, but you are not. You do not ask for perfect understanding. Instead, you reveal yourself to us again and again that we might come to know you. Help us to trust your steadfast love and desire to welcome us home. Forgive us when our need for mastery or control keeps us stuck, when fear prevents us from taking risks, when insecurity holds us back from loving like you love. Help us to accept the peace you graciously offer and have mercy on us when we hoard or hide that peace, when we fail to offer it to others. Renew us, risen Lord, and make us whole in our willingness to trust you that in this world of strife we may be bearers of your peace by showing the world that because you live, abundant life is possible for all. In resurrection hope we pray. And we continue now with our silent prayers. And the words and even the groanings of our hearts we offer to God in gratitude that we do so knowing that we are never alone and always loved. And in the name of Jesus who teaches us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And remaining seated and in the spirit of prayer, and as we've been doing all through throughout this Easter season, we'll sing is our prayer hymn number 243, Be Not Afraid. college one day uh, on a Saturday after lunch, uh, I reluctantly accepted the invitation to go hear Leighton Ford, the brother-in-law of Billy Graham, talk. Some Bible-banging Christian-y person invited me to go, and I went, and I still remember one thing this man said. He was an evangelist in his own right. He said, if it depends on you and me, we can never be sure. But the good news, it does not our acceptance into God's presence, our chance and opportunity for life, for abundant life, for forgiveness and reconciliation, to change the direction of our lives, all of those, our ability to do that doesn't depend on our own steam, our own efforts, even our own faith, but rather the love of God. So friends, believe and trust the good news this Sunday morning in the season of Easter. If you are in Christ, your past is finished and gone, and for you everything is fresh and new and filled with hope. Trust and believe that good news. In Christ Jesus, you are loved and you are forgiven.
Amen. Let's all stand and return God that gift of love. <laughs> Some of you are coming back from spring break trips. If you're a Montclair school system kind of family, it is good to be together here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, welcome to the Presbyterian Church of Montclair, especially if you're a visitor. Welcome if you are worshiping online. We're all together in one family of faith, one worshiping body by the power and presence of the Spirit. So it is good to be together. If you're in the sanctuary and sitting near the center aisle, please grab that black booklet. If you're at the end of your pew and near the center aisle, you'll find that black ritual of friendship pad there. And if you'd be kind enough to fill it out, that would be a great gift. And if there are people in your pew today, you could pass it along to them and then back to its starting place. That would be wonderful during the course of the service. Take a look at your canary-colored insert. The big news is that next Sunday is... PCUM's got talent. PCUM's got talent. PCUM's got talent. Mark your calendars now. If it was in pencil, change it to pen. At 3 o'clock, we'll gather in Fellowship Hall over there uh, for a fundraiser to continue to support and augment our amazing music ministry with all of our uh, wonderful vocalists and instrumentalists. Matt, welcome today. Good to have you here. Uh, and uh, if you'll come next... Sunday at 3 p.m., you're going to have a great time and be wowed by the amazing gifts and talents which are, uh, have been bestowed by God upon this congregation. If you have talents you'd like to bestow on this congregation, please talk to Anne Marie Giuliano. Get in touch with the church at your earliest convenience as though it is coming right up. I don't have time throughout this week to learn how to sing, so I am not going to be there for doing that, and that's another reason to come. It should be a nice time. So again, uh, please take a look at that on your, in your bulletin and make that arrangements to please be here for that fundraiser. There's other, uh, other announcements as well before you. Uh, I just want to highlight really quickly that next weekend is going to be a big weekend. We're going to have a wedding here in the sanctuary. Our youth group and some adults will be doing the midnight run on Saturday evening into New York City. We have worship on Sunday morning, 10 a.m., and then, of course, PCUM's got talent. So pray for and with us all at that busy weekend comes up. Uh, I want to just let you all know that uh, if I vanish here after the sermon, uh, a little bit after the sermon, it won't be because I didn't like the sermon. It's because I have to sneak out and get to Newark to be part of a, a baptism uh, down there. So it's not because I'm being antisocial or anything. Uh, just uh, I want you to know that if you see me, see, if you see me vanish. Uh, the end of the service is in excellent hands, I promise you. Uh, and with that, let me invite, speaking of excellent hands and voices and hearts, I'd like to invite the choir forward now. <coughs>
Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 21, verses 1 through 7. Let's listen for what God is saying to the church this morning. In your strength the king rejoices, O Lord, and in your help how greatly he exalts. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. He asked you for life. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your help. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. You bestow on him blessings forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. The word of the Lord. In rhythm. Okay. I need one more child up here. Doesn't know they're coming up yet. If you are, how many of you are over 20? Over 30, over 40, over 50? If you're over 50 sitting in the front pew and you went to Colgate University, two, come on. Oh, there's one. <laughs> just, he could just sit, sit over there on that, right there on the step. Grab, there you go. Perfect, Tom. Now, you might know this about Tom. Tom not only sings, he's also an actor. That's why I invited him up here. Because Tom, without saying or singing anything, kind of in a mime mode, is going to show you guys how to define a word, or at least how he thinks it should be defined. Do you ever do definitions in school about, of words? You learn new words? Okay. Can you tell me what the word repent means? Anybody know? Did your parents use that a lot around the house? Like mine did? Huh? Repent. What does it mean? It's like you pented and then you have to repent. What does it mean? Uh, well, to be forgiven. Well, that comes after repenting on a good day. To forgive. To forgive. No, that's, uh, no, you forgive someone who is repented or is repenting, but you guys are on the right track. But again, I'm going to ask... Tom, or a.k.a. Mr. McElwee here, without saying anything, just to using his body, his images, movements, how do you think, we, how, when we grew up, Tom, you and I are the same age, you're a little younger, yes, I know, a few months, but if you just sort of act out how repent, if you had heard the word repent, what would you do? Get ready for this. See, that's my problem here, is that I got someone who actually knows what it really means. <laughs> okay, so what, 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 did, what did Tom just do? He walked back and forth. <laughs> like he probably did all the time, just like confused. He was going one way, and then what did he do? He turned around. That's all repent means. When I was growing up, I didn't know that. I thought it meant I was supposed to be mad at myself or ashamed of myself for something I did. Something that needed forgiveness, like Andrew and Luke just said, right? Repent. Do you have, anybody ever worn sackcloth and ashes here? Or, you know, beat your breasts? You know, how many of us, when we heard the word repent, sort of made, made us feel badly about ourselves? We were ashamed, right? Uh, anybody grew up in a born-again bat? There we go. <laughs> I can see us all. We all raise our hands, right? But repent doesn't mean that. It simply means to change direction. Tom is exactly right. So if you're doing something and it's not working very well, if it's hurting you or somebody else, God just wants you to repent. Like I'm just doing something, I'm going along here, 
Repent. Everybody stand up for me. I'm going to have you, uh, you ever, ever played Mother May I? Or like, uh, you know, forget that. Pastor, just, just like this. I want you to walk that way, and whenever I say repent, I'd like you to repent. Please go. Go ahead. Repent. Repent. Keep going. I didn't say repent again yet. Here we go. Repent. Okay, now you're sin hard and fast. Repent. Now really, keep going. Go to the turn. You're really not going to change. No one's going to stop you. And, and, okay, repent back up here, please. Good job. Big, I like people who repent with a big smile on their face. So this is important, right? Sometimes when we're going the wrong way, it does cause damage, it hurts, or we feel like we're kind of alone. But God doesn't want us to feel badly about ourselves. God just wants us to turn back in a different direction and go back toward God. That's all repent is. And that's an important part of what Jesus, after he was raised, told the church to do. Just keep turning toward me. Keep turning toward God. If you get off track a little bit, just adjust your headings on your compass. Right? How, what's a good way to find the right direction toward God? What would you do? How would you find out? What are some things you can do? Um, find the sun. Find the sun, yes, exactly. Good. Get your bearings. Think about this beautiful world God created. What else? What can you do to find out which direction God wants you to go in? I'll give you a hint. Pray, okay, that's good. What about this? Read. What would I read? The Bible. Bible is a good place to start. You can read other things too. God is everywhere. So whenever you hear the word repent, just remember, do what Tom does all the time. He's always repenting. I mean, the guy's got a lot to repent for, right? But he just turns direction because he knows God will be waiting for him. He knows God loves him. God loves you too. Let's do a repeat after me prayer, okay? You ready? Dear God, thank you for telling us to repent, and that when we do, when we change course, you're there waiting for us. We love you. Amen. Thank you, kids. You can go to Sunday school. Now. stuck the landing. That's excellent. Our second reading this morning, once again, as it did last week, comes from the 24th chapter, the final chapter in Luke's gospel. You might remember, uh, if you were here in person or online, uh, that we looked at the famous road to Emmaus story, which only happens in Luke in the 24th chapter, as Jesus is walking along, disguised, though, as a stranger, as he goes on the road beside two very dejected disciples who thought that his execution and crucifixion were the end of the story. Of course, they aren't. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to you now in the remainder or in very last section of the 24th chapter of Luke's Gospel, beginning with the 36th verse. While they, the disciples, were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. You can see here Luke's version of that famous story in John where doubting Thomas requires that he touch the risen Christ. This is Luke's version of that same moment. 
Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of, of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. May the meditations of our hearts together upon your word today be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So according to Luke, these are Jesus' final words, his last words. And like a lot of last words, they're kind of surprising. I think last words usually surprise us. They're never what I expect anyway. I used to think, for example, that at the end of life, as death approached, the prospect of death and looking back over one's life would, require, would cause the dying person in their last moments always to say something deep and profound and amazing, something more uh, uh, momentous than usual normal everyday talk, it turns out that just isn't so. On his deathbed, Voltaire, the French Enlightenment writer, historian, and philosopher, known for his criticism of Christianity, when asked by a priest there in his, in his, during his last breaths to renounce Satan finally, Voltaire reportedly said, now is not the time to make another enemy. And when he died in a hotel, <laughs> I, I should have waited for that to sink in, yeah. Uh, when he died in a hotel, Oscar Wilde, the Irish poet and playwright known for his witty sayings, known as epigrams, looked around the room and with his last breath said, either that wallpaper goes or I do. <laughs> at, the, at the end of his life, Bob Hope, that famous comedian, replied to his wife's question about where he wanted to be buried with the answer, surprise me. <laughs> and sometimes last words never even get out. We, we, we try to say them, but something stops us. There was John Sedgwick, a Union Army general during the Civil War, who famously said just before being shot by a Confederate bullet, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dis... <laughs> you can fill it in, right? And again, it's not only the last words we say before death. Have you ever had something to say to someone you were saying goodbye to or something you wanted to hear from someone from whom you were parting and it just didn't come out right? Last words often take us in an unexpected direction. Either we don't say it the way we plan to say it or we don't hear it the way we expect to hear it. Last words take us in a different direction. If you're of a certain age, you'll remember the famous TV detective Columbo, played by Peter Falk, one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Did you know that Columbo pioneered what is pretty common in these days, the inverted detective story? Not a whodunit, but a how catch em, right? The audience knows who done it pretty much from the beginning. This genre shows begins by showing the crime and its perpetrator so there isn't any question in our minds about who the perpetrator of the criminal really is, but the show plays out with the police, in this case the detective Columbo, resolving who the perpetrator is and how they did it during the course of the show, and they're finally caught and exposed. And the way it worked with Columbo is, he would, he would always in his very disorganized, messy way have a conversation with the witness who is pretty sketchy and we think Either we know he did it or probably did it, but the conversation with the witness never goes very well. The person being interviewed looks at this slovenly, disorganized guy with stains, mustard stains on his trench coat, and the witness becomes increasingly condescending and overconfident, knowing this bright, not so, I'm sorry, this not so bright detective is never going to be able to catch them. And when the conversation wraps up and Columbo's leaving and the, and the witness is leaving, Columbo always would say, Oh, just one more thing. And ask the question, 
which would expose both the crime and the criminal and catch them cold. Today, Jesus is just saying to us, oh, just one more thing, and giving us last words which are shocking. Thus it is written, there in the 24th chapter of Luke, he says, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem and going outward. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. These words are written at the end of Luke's gospel for a reason. They are undoubtedly words that, according to Luke, Christ meant for all of us, his followers, to remember and to obey. But are they the words we expect? Because I think that without this passage, without these words written down here, it would be easy to assume that the final message Jesus would give to his disciples would be messages like he says in other places in his gospel. Love one another, for example. As I have loved you, love one another. The great, uh, the, the commandment he gives at the Last Supper. We talk about the love of Christ every day here in church, every Sunday and every other day. Obviously, no one loved like Jesus. He taught love as the central ethic of life, and certainly of the Christian life. But that isn't the message he delivered in his final words to his disciples, his final instructions. And this, I think, is critical for us. If we talk about and preach about only the love of Christ, I'm not sure how different we are from another, other nice groups of people like my parents' bowling league when I was growing up. When I was new at one of my former churches, not this one, I had my first meeting with the evangelism and membership committee in a church that had not really had many new members in many, many years. I asked the chairperson of the evangelism and new membership committee, well, what makes our church special? I was still trying to get to know this church. He looked at me and he had kind of a sort of a bemused, confused look on his face, and he said, um, his answer was really more like a question, um, we're friendly? <laughs> that was his evangelistic message. Nothing wrong with a friendly church. They were friendly. They still are friendly. We're friendly, welcoming, like a great beach club or a community garden. Maybe a great place to raise your kids. But I think Jesus, in these last words, reminds us that he asks, demands, and then out of love equips us for a lot more than that. A lot more. You think the last words, we expect the last words to be kumbaya, love, 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 let's eat, something like that. And Jesus says, oh, ah, just one more thing. Um, love by itself doesn't work. Love is the center of my message, but it's not the complete message. Thus it is written that repentance and forgiveness are to be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Let me repeat this. Christ's last words to us are not what, they think, what we think they're going to be. They are that the church is to say to itself, to each other, and to anybody who will listen, repent and receive forgiveness. Now I feel like I'm back in my Baptist born-again days. Except for, if you think about it and pay close attention, it probably doesn't mean what I heard back then and a lot of people would expect today when they hear the words repent and forgive. Let's start with repentance this morning. We've already done that with the children and with Tom. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It simply means change your understanding or your point of view, metanoia, just change. Not be filled with shame, not beat yourself up, not have remorse freeze you, stuck on the past, no, simply change. Hebrew, in Hebrew, the word for repentance is shuv. It literally means turn, just turn 
around. The last thing that Jesus tells us to proclaim to ourselves and to the world, to shout from the rooftops is, repent. Just turn, just change, get yourself back with us. If we talk the talk, we've got to walk the walk, otherwise people can tell, they can really tell. So in this club, this warm, friendly club that we have, we need to keep asking ourselves, and we do, what direction is my life headed? Which way am I going? And if we're honest, we have to admit that a lot of times, for a lot of us and people we know and care about, that direction isn't working out, even if we do a pretty good job of keeping it secret. We want to say to people we know who are going the wrong way, turn around. Like the scene in my favorite movie, because I was an extra, even though you can't see me, planes, trains, and automobiles, where they're driving on the wrong side of the highway and someone pulls up in the right side of the highway going the same direction and yells, you're going the wrong way. And Steve Martin and John Candy go, how do they know where we're going right before the crash? That's a great example. I love that example. It's a really great movie if you haven't seen it. But a better example, of course, is in Luke's gospel, and only Luke tells it, the story of the prodigal son. When the young son who's insulted and dishonored his father, taken all of his inheritance while his father is still alive, spent it on wine, women, and song. In other words, he went to Vegas. Spends it all, is bereft, is on his knees in a pigsty eating what the pigs aren't eating. That's pretty low for a Jewish kid. In that moment, Luke says, and when he came to himself, he turned back toward his father and began his journey home. And in that moment of turning back toward his father, you could argue, and I do, that the younger son was a lot closer than the well-behaved older son is right there at home because the younger son's trust was completely now on the father who was going to welcome him as a son. Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe, ran away from home and went to sea as a young man. His father protested young Defoe's plans and his mother cried, but Defoe was determined to have his way. On his very first voyage out, his ship was wrecked and young Defoe barely escaped with his life. He saw his foolishness and the bad choices he had made but now he was afraid to go home because his friends would make fun of him. And remembering how he felt, Daniel Defoe came to the conclusion that people are not so much ashamed of their sin as they are ashamed and reluctant to repent. It's really hard to change your direction when you've got yourself into a nice pattern. Studies in psychology reinforce that truth. They show that once we've decided on a course of action, especially a dubious course of action, a course even totally out of our normal character and of our better selves, we will build up all kinds of rationalizations to justify staying on that destructive, futile course of action. We are geniuses at explaining to ourselves and rationalizing as to why we keep doing what we're doing. But underneath it all is our pride. We harden in our justification until we get to the point that we'd rather fight and argue than change directions than repent, even though that what we're doing is stupid beyond belief. Anybody ever been there? I certainly have. And the message comes from Christ today and from those who love us in his very final words, in his, oh, and one more thing statement, just turn around. For your own sake, for the sake of those who love you the most before it's too late, just turn around. That's the first message Christ has for us today. Repent. The second is to proclaim forgiveness to each other, to the world, and to ourselves. How do you feel about your life thus far? All in all, pretty good. Do you have any regrets? Do you look back over your life and wish you had done some things differently, said some things differently, not said certain things? Most of us have parts of our lives we wouldn't 
especially want to share with our children or our spouse or our parents or the people in the pews around us. Most of us can look back and say, gee, I didn't handle that moment very well, did I? I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. If only I could go back and get a do-over, a mulligan. It's Master's Weekend. But what hurts us most, I think, when we don't forgive or don't forgive ourselves is the distance we put between us and God between us and others, and between us and even our best selves. And that, I deeply believe, is all that sin is. It's just the distance between us and the God who made us to be embraced closely in God's loving arms. Again, it's not about shame. It's not about degrees of sin. It's simply where are we focused, what's most important to us, What and who are we born to be? Whose are we born to be? Forgiveness, as defined in our tradition, the Reformed Protestant Presbyterian tradition, I love this, is defined as reconciliation. Not pardon, just reconciliation, reunion, homecoming, like when that younger son finally did get home with his speech of, 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 of sorrow and remorse all prepared before he could even open his mouth the father just embraced him and said you're home I love you when you think about forgiveness like that then our quote today at the beginning of our bulletin makes a little bit more sense Richard Rohr the amazing theologian Christian commentator says on a person's journey everything has its place Our failures, heartbreaks, defeats, and victories, our wounds, dreams, and passions, our stops and our starts all have a place in our story and all have a place in our transformation from shadow people to real humans. Everything has meaning and everything belongs. Easter morning means nothing without Good Friday. Otherwise, it's a nice place to be. It's all warm and fuzzy. But if you've been lost and then suddenly get found, you know what real joy is, what real relief is. We don't have to live out that self-defeating script anymore because we hear the words and we get to say the words to each other. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are precious. And everything and anything you could have ever done doesn't change that good news, that truth. So Jesus' last words kind of catch us off guard like Columbo does. He says, it is about love. It's about justice. It's about peace. It's about all those things. But we can't generate any of those things on our own in spite of the fact that we try. And unfortunately, the church tries too much as well. We can't generate love, peace, justice, hope without the gift, the dual gift of repentance, just turning back toward God and forgiveness, just reconciliation with the God who made us to be embraced, to be loved, to never be alone. Please pray with me. Loving God, we ask that we are given the gift of your spirit today that we might hear your last words to us before you ascend and give us in your place the gift of your spirit that there is hope for real change not just for us but through us in small ways real change in a world that is desperate for hope desperate for reconciliation for mending for repair for love that is truly sustainable because it can come from you We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is, In the Bulb There is a Flower, number 250. If you're able, please stand.
Amen. Please be seated. That's a beautiful new hymn to me, and I didn't realize until I was reading at the bottom that it was based on a line from a T.S. Eliot poem, my favorite poet. So, in the bulb there is a flower. It'll probably uh, blossom again in the life of this church, I think. Let's join our hearts together in, pray, in prayer. Please pray with me. God of abundant grace, we gather on this Easter season Sunday just as your first disciples gathered in the wake of the resurrection in joy and in wonder and in doubt and disbelief. We remember that whenever we gather in your name, you always appear in our midst, never as we expect, but always deeply real and offering us the comfort of your presence and the assurance and repeated reassurance of your love. And we give you thanks that, like those first disciples, you give us a community in which to practice our trust in you. So grant us grace to hold space for one another's doubts and questions, and especially our own. Give us courage to admit that we do not have all the answers. Make this church family of friends and visitors and members where we a place where we explore what it means to receive your forgiveness again and again and turn our lives toward you. We remember, O oh God, that when the risen Christ first appeared to his disciples, he offered them peace. Our world, our lives are deeply in need of that peace, a peace that is not only the absence of conflict but the presence of wholeness for all people we pray for innocent victims of war in Ukraine and Gaza and Israel and all around the world. Put an end to violence, Lord. Teach us to recognize our shared humanity, our shared status as your beloved children. Each of us created in your image. Lead each of us, we pray, to prioritize peace. We pray for all who sit in seats of power that you, even if they are resistant, would fill their hearts with compassion and their decisions with wisdom. Most of God, we ask that you would save us all from despair and cynicism. Open our eyes to see the signs of resurrection life that are all around us and between us and even inside of us. Plant hope within us again, we pray, and help us to nurture it, that hope, that it may grow more robust each day, and may we begin to imagine the future of our own lives and a world defined by your shalom. Loving Lord, we pray for members of our community here who need your care, and also those in our families and circle of friends and co-workers who need you as well. Ease the suffering of the sick. Speed the healing of those in recovery, we pray, and comfort those who mourn. We especially lift up Gary and Michelle today. We ask you also to be with Bill Herlock as they mourn, his family mourns the death of Bill's father. We ask you to surround the isolated with love and soothe the troubled minds of the anxious. And Lord of life, remind us of our call to love one another as you have loved us and always to know that we can only discover that love by reorienting the direction of our lives to you again and again and again and then immersing ourselves in your forgiveness and your welcome home. Bless us as we go forward. Bless us as we give now from our resources to support the life and work of this body of Christ here and all around this world. And we ask all these things in the name of the resurrected Christ. Amen. Will the ushers come forward?
behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. We 
Our closing hymn is hymn number 238, Thine is the Glory. Just one more thing. Let us go out from this place with these words of hope in our responsive benediction. May the peace of God reign in your heart. May the Spirit of God flow through your life. May the joy of God.